And let the mountains fall. So we know this is true. So no Though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So to keep me from becoming conceited, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak then I am strong. Paul is a deep, complicated character. You see, he decided not to boast in his accomplishments. He actually decided to boast on his sufferings. Not whining and complaining. I've done that. But the previous chapter, he spoke of being, he received 39 lashes five different times. He was beaten with a rod three times. One time he was stoned, which is, blows my mind because he, he got stoned, he knocked, got knocked out, he got up and went back in and started preaching again. That's awesome. Three times he was shipwrecked, always, always had people against him, but, but Paul was a warrior. He received a vision from God here. He calls it a thorn of the flesh, a messenger from Satan. And he says twice in verse 7 that I would not become conceited. There's some clues there. So let's start. What was the thorn of the flesh? There's been lots of ideas over 2,000 years of speculation. So I have to first say to you, I will not give you an absolute answer. And anybody who gives you an absolute answer needs to check themselves. But we we can look at it. And see what, the, see what the Lord says. Some think it was an ongoing temptation. The, the old holiness used to call it a besetting sin. Something that kept, just wouldn't let go of me. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you got one of those. You probably do. I do. But is it of God that he would give you intensely a temptation? See, I think we have to look at the book of James in the first chapter that says, God is not a tempter, nor can he be tempted. But we are tempted when we are drawn away and enticed by our own flesh. So if you have a besetting sin, something that keeps tempting you, you might want to consider changing your environment. You might want to stop putting yourself in front of the things that keep tempting you and think you're going to be strong enough to overcome it. But I don't think that was a thorn. See, God is our refuge from temptation, not the cause of it. And let's remember, too, that temptations are always given to us to try to tear you down. But a trial is given to you to build you up. And I I was hoping to hear at least one amen on that one. Do we believe that? This is a good distinction. If, I'm, if, I'm, if I have a temptation, it's trying to tear me down. It's trying to take me into darkness, trying to take me into shame and guilt. But if I'm in a trial, something I keep trying to change and it won't change, then we need to look to God to see, Lord, what are you trying to build up? He's never, God is never, he's never the power behind the temptation. He's a refuge. Now, was it simply a demonic assault? Could very well be. Can't argue against that. A demonic assault that just kept hitting him. Spiritually manifested from the enemy. Some of the greatest people of our, of our time have, have, have had spiritual assaults. Charles Spurgeon, one of the greatest preachers of the time. He was assaulted with depression and anxiety and doubts. That didn't come from God. That came from the enemy. Martin Luther suffer from depression. He had gastric issues 
that he, he, he only lived, he lived a short life because his body kept getting tormented by these issues. Now, it could be because he self-medicated with beer. I don't know. But that's, we'll leave that for another sermon. I'll let Pastor Eric handle that one. But this, maybe it was demonic. Certainly the demonic influenced it, the storm, because the demon wanted to bring Paul down. But this says it was a thorn of his flesh. So I'm just going to propose to you that I think that Paul's eyesight was his thorn. He asked for healing three times. Paul had seen other people healed of blindness, of deafness. He had seen people raised from the dead. So it makes sense that he would come after trying to heal this, right? Just get it out of the way so I can see better and I can function. I won't need people to help me around. In fact, I can even write my own letters if you, get, if you give me some eyesight. As it was, he needed help in all of, his, all of his journeys. He would write in large letters the greetings or, the, or the, the end, the salutations. He would write it to verify his authorship, but he often couldn't write the whole thing. It humbled him. There was one place in Acts where he's in front of the high priest who, who has an ornamented headdress and a, and a and a very clear distinction as to who the head man is. And Paul sarcastically answered him, and he got struck in the face by the, by the guard that said, how dare you speak to the high priest? And Paul said, oh, please forgive me. I didn't know you were the high priest. Well, why didn't he know? He couldn't see him. Imagine everything that Paul did without the fullness of his sight the trips and the shipwrecks and and the near drownings, and with all that, to not be able to see well enough to help himself. I think that thorn made him completely dependent on God and other people. And again, I can't say that for sure. And I think that God left it vague. Because if if he had labeled what it was, as you're reading, you'll say, well, I'm glad I don't have that, and then you skip on. Right? But by leaving it open, there's other things I think that are more important to be drawn from this lesson. Here's what we can learn from Paul it's okay to ask for your own healing. Now, that seems like a kind of a silly thing to even have to mention, but how many of y'all struggle with praying for yourself? Why is that? Does it feel selfish to pray for yourself? Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw one at you. It's actually prideful. It's good that your heart is filled to want to pray for other people. But if you think that you can do this Christian thing without continually praying for yourself, you're thinking you've now been filled enough that you're good. We're not. It's constant dependency. It's a good thing. And I, look, I'm still working on that. Because there's plenty of people to pray for that are worse off than me. But if I'm not at my best, I can't be all that Christ has made me to be. And I need him to keep filling me. I know that God knows. I don't know why he kept the thorn. I don't know why he may keep your thorn. But this thing I know, he knows you. And he loves you. He knows what you need. He knows when you need it. He knows when to press in. And he knows when to let up. I have permission to tell this story. I think it's, for me, it's the most vivid picture of somebody who has a thorn. And he didn't particularly like when I offered that explanation, but um, my dear friend, uh, Nevin Krause, he's a 93-year-old warrior for Christ. He still teaches. He does funerals. He perseveres through pain that debilitates him in his back. And how many times he says to me the day after he teaches his class, he said, Rob, I didn't get any sleep the night before. Not a, not a wink. I was kept up all night praying for my sin and for God to release me from this back pain. And, and, and you know what? I know it was God because when I got up to teach It was him. I brought nothing to the table. 
that's only been the last few weeks. This has been going on for a couple of years. And his old holiness movement teaching says, there must be something that's wrong that I'm, I'm my sin. There must be something that I need to get rid of in order to be relieved of the pain. That's the teaching from the holiness movement, late 1800s, the Nazarenes and the Methodists. They believed, like Job's friends, remember them? Must be something wrong, Job. You got to be doing something wrong for all this calamity to happen to you. That's not true. So when I mentioned to my brother, so God makes you dependent on him, you go to prayer, you feel his anointing, you deliver his word in your exhaustion. Doesn't that sound like a thorn? And if you know Nevin, he said, well, that's not what I wanted to hear. (laughs) But you know what? I saw a peace come over him because it was evidence of God's work in his life. And if you have a thorn, if there's something that won't go away, don't assume it's because you've done something wrong. I believe there's reasons why God doesn't just take some things from us. And while I'm here, let's make a distinction between a thorn and a trial. A trial is for a season. You can look back and see yourself go into the trial, and you can see the evidence that you're coming out of the trial. A thorn doesn't leave. It refuses to leave. If I haven't mentioned already, I believe that sometimes I think God gave Paul a companion for his journey. He finally saw his thorn as his companion, unwelcomed, but a companion that went perfectly with, his, with the gospel. So what can we learn from God in these scriptures? For whatever the thorn is, what do we learn? You're not going to like this one. Now this goes against a lot of modern teaching. Because depending on who you like to listen to on the internet, God is all about your comfort. He is all about raising you up, giving you money, making you feel good about yourself, building your self-esteem. That's not the God of the Bible. He, what he is most dedicated to is conforming you to the image of Christ so that you can be a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's already given us eternal life. We're promised the majority of our existence to be without pain, without sadness, without hurt. But you may have to spend a couple of years in this life helping other people get through their stuff. So his promise to relieve is true, but it may not be for the moment. And I know I'm preaching to people who have gone through some things far worse than I have. So I don't want you to feel, I don't want you to, to, to sense, I'm hoping you don't receive any shame in what I'm saying. What we're looking for is God's purpose in this. See, Paul was an amazing apostle of Christ, but he, he was not without his own issues. He still needed some character development. He was, a, he was an, a Pharisee. He was educated by Gamaliel. He was, he was educated. He was, he was kind of arrogant in a lot of ways. He knew the law completely. When he was interrupted and converted on the road to Damascus, what was he doing? He was on his way to kill some Christians. Why? Because they were following this whole Jesus thing. So Paul appointed himself judge and executioner. I'm right. I got the law. And I'm going to let you know it too. That sounds arrogant, doesn't it? Paul had some personality things that God was working on. Paul's sarcasm, he used it like a Swiss army knife. He could chop you up and smile the whole time doing it. That's kind of what he did in 2 Corinthians. If you look at it, you heard the tone of it. He, now, I, like, here's, this is something based on Pastor Eric's teaching. I wouldn't use sarcasm with your children because they're probably better at it. So just to get off the sarcasm thing, it's not a weapon to be, to be utilized. Paul also called out Peter for being a hypocrite. He called out John Mark for being weak. He would have nothing to do with him. Hear the arrogance? Now, I'm not saying Paul didn't have his humble moments. But even in ministry, the one who God chose, he was still a work in progress. Paul would call out an entire church while he was in a prison cell. 
He would call everybody out who he could find. I think he, he wrestled with his own arrogance at times, if you will. He didn't lack for knowledge or passion, but God decided to give him something to help balance that. Whatever that thorn was, knowledge and passion are helpful, but humility is the true mark of a Christian. Humility is the true mark of a Christian. So let's talk about humility just for a moment. That seemed to be what God's intended purpose was to create humility. So it's worth looking at. It's worth seeking. Jesus himself said, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for, my, for I am gentle and humble in spirit. Why does he ask us to come to him? Because he's gentle and humble. Not because he's passionate and proud. Andrew Murray, and by the way, any of y'all like to read? If you want to expand your, your wisdom on humility, read anything by Andrew Murray. Because he's an old guy, his books are really cheap, too. That's awesome. <laughs> but wisdom is wisdom, guys. So Andrew Murray says, humility is simply the disposition which prepares the soul for living on trust. Humility is simply the disposition to prepare the soul to be able to live on trust. You can't do it without humility. I think it's the truest sign of a devoted Christian. So here's how Paul showed his humility, even though he was a work in progress. When, when he got that answer from God, the answer was no. Paul had a choice at that time. How many of y'all have God has in his own way said no? Okay, three of us. Okay, the rest of y'all doing good. I'm saying he, he doesn't say no. He just doesn't do what you're asking him. Well, that's the same thing. Either way, it's still a no. So he had a choice. And when he, when he hit that no, he decided to adjust his attitude and recognize who's in charge. That's a powerful transition. And some of us are still trying to learn who's in charge. I don't learn easily. I tell people almost every time I preach, I didn't wake up one day and say, I think I'm going to try this Christian thing. No, I was crushed and collapsed at the altar of Christ. That was my accomplishment. I was crushed and collapsed and said, Lord, even, I don't even know if you're out there, but I'm done. There's many ways for us to be humbled. I suggest for people to take the better way. Paul says, Spurgeon wrote, Paul said, quote, there was given to me. He reckoned his great trial to be a gift. It is well put. He does not say there was inflicted upon me a thorn in the flesh. But he says there was given to me. Are you willing to consider that your trial that you're going through or your thorn that you can't get away from, are you willing to consider that this might be a purpose attached to it from God. Paul wrote in the Philippians, it, it, something has shifted in him when this I say thing, I think, again, his I say, when it wouldn't stop, his later letters have a different tone. He's softer. Philippians is one of his later ones. He said, I have found the secret to contentment. Philippians 4. Whether I'm abased or abound, whether I'm hungry or whether I'm full, I have found contentment in all things. Philippians 4.13. Because I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. He realized no matter what he was going through, God was with him and God had his back. Maybe instead of praying, and this is kind of where I'm at in my life, if God hasn't released what I'm asking him to heal, and I, let me tell you, God has healed some things in me. So I know he said yes. My, my knees are better now than they were when I was 30. I can walk further now better than when I was 50. And I've asked him to do that. Lord, keep, keep my body healthy so I can just keep going. Now, I know that's going to come to an end, but I'm going to run until the end of it. <laughs> just going to run. Just going to keep asking him. 
but I'm also now asking God for something else. Lord, increase my capacity to handle what you've given me. If you won't change my circumstance, will you increase my capacity to handle all that I have to handle? And I want to commend that to you. He will increase your capacity to whatever, whatever you need, but you have to shift your attitude to ask for it. Increase capacity. That might be the, of everything I say today, that might be the best thing to remember. Why else would God keep, my, keep a thorn in place? He might be trying to equip you for ministry. Whatever's not removed from you becomes your testimony of God's strength and your endurance. Whatever you've endured, whatever you're enduring right now, it becomes your resume. If someone comes to me, and this happened a couple years ago, someone comes to me who was recently stricken with being in a wheelchair. Look, I can have prayer for them. I can have compassion but I don't have the resume. So what do I do? I hook him up with Joe. No, he's got a resume in a chair since he was 14. Never heard it. Never heard him complain a word about it. That's the one who I want to hook this man up because Joe, has, he's, he's got the resume for ministry. And some of you have a perfect resume for what you've been through that pastors or elders or whatever the titles, we can't touch it because you've lived it. So maybe God is increasing your resume to be able to love and help other people because of what you've been through. See, he calls us holy priests. I don't care what you call you. He calls you a holy priest. He's commending you to minister to other people, to love other people, to walk with other people. And we can't do that if all of our constant prayers is about trying, Lord, will you get me out of this situation? Instead, maybe he's saying, Lord, use me in this situation. See, Paul's thorn wasn't removed, it was used. If he won't remove your thorn, allow him to use it. Because he doesn't waste anything. He uses everything. 1 Peter 2, 9, it's not up here. It says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. I got one final one for you. Maybe the reason why he hasn't removed what you're going through is because he's trying to increase your faith to prepare you for life. It sounds like a strange one, but let me, let me try to explain um, I've been in the book of Jeremiah lately. How many of y'all read in the Jeremiah at all? It's depressing. Okay. There's, there's a lot of stuff going on. And this one prophet keeps bringing to the first 10 chapters. He's just bringing God's word. God's like, I, you were my children. You ran away from me. I'm, now I'm going to have to punish you. It's going to hurt. I mean, this is Jeremiah's life over and over. Until finally, the, some of the local people get tired of hearing it. So by chapter 11... There's two or three of them that are going to take him out. They can't handle the word of the Lord, so they're just going to take care of the messenger. Don't get any ideas up here. <laughs> that was a joke. Come on. But in, in, by the 12th chapter, Jeremiah's like, God, why don't you just take them out? You know these are my enemies. You know, you know what they're doing. So here's what God says to Jeremiah. And I just, that poor man. God said in in, in 12, he says, if you have raced with men on foot and they have worn you out, how can you compete with the horses? If you stumble in safe country, how will you manage in the thickets by the Jordan? So instead of relieving him and taking these men out, God said, Jeremiah, this is your boot camp, son. If you can't handle these guys, then what are you going to happen when I take you to Jerusalem and they lock you in the stocks or they put you in the guard's prison, or they put you in a cistern overnight. How are you going to handle that unless you learn to handle this? The thorn or situation that you are going through, it might be training you up for what's ahead. Embrace all things, folks. There's a purpose in everything we're going through. I'm not saying it's justice. I'm saying there's a purpose to it that only God can reveal and use for his good purpose. 
And this is, Pam and I have been joking about this for a decade in Bible studies, which brings us to how can we read in the book of James when he says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you fall into trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And let perseverance have its complete work in you that you may be perfect and complete in Christ Jesus. You cannot be perfected apart from trial. It's not possible. It's like going out and playing a football game without ever putting on the pads, without ever getting hit, without ever trying to run. You can't be good. And I know this isn't a game, but, but Paul says we are in a race. So as we prepare for communion, I'm going to ask the team to come up and for those who are willing to pray with us. There's a final point of the scripture that I can't do justice to in one sermon. And I'm hoping one, one of the teachers later this year will take this invitation, whoever it is. God says, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace, my grace is sufficient for you. See, grace, it's a term that we see more than 120 times in the New Testament. It's not just a one meaning word. It's used multiple ways. Grace just isn't. It, mercy, mercy is when I don't get, we sang about mercy. Mercy is when I don't get what I deserved. Grace is the abundance of giving me more than I, than I have earned. Hear the difference? Grace isn't just overlooking my sin. It's also the power of Christ that we receive at salvation. It's the power to overcome hardships and naysayers and temptations and fatigue and doubt and false beliefs and false teachers and anything that hinders me from following Christ. There is a grace that God has promised to all of us because he said he is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. If you're hurting today, Lord, give me grace. Give me more grace. Because Jesus himself is the grace. He's the power. So when God says, my grace is sufficient for you, he literally is saying, I'm enough for you. My power is already within you. Stop searching and yearning for relief when I have given you power to overcome. You can do this. That's why we celebrate these truths every week because we need reminding, don't we? Doesn't the week beat you down? Doesn't your failure or other people, doesn't it get tiring? We come here to the table because if you have believed in the testimony of Christ and you have received his forgiveness by faith. Jesus says, you're now my child. All that I have is, is in you. So I invite you now to come to the table and celebrate these truths. And if you need prayer, we have some folks up here. We'd love to pray with you. So come and celebrate.